Hi guys. Yes, we're coming to you virtually this time for our sit down interview series. And I apologize in advance for that. We have always been quite stringent or strict in terms of having these interviews in person with, with the people who are joining us on the show. Uh, because I feel that we get a lot more of an authentic re reaction and response from those discussions. And we had originally planned to do this interview in person with Kevin in Berlin last week. But unfortunately, situations changed, things came up and we were unable to, to do that. So Kevin suggested that we still do it virtually uh, the following week, which is here we are today. So I agreed to do it virtually in this instance. I've been trying to get Kevin on the show for some time and I didn't really want to miss the opportunity, nor did I want to have to wait for another number of months until he and I were both in the same city and then also had the time to, to spend to sit down and have a chat. So with all of that said, the next interview will be in our person, I promise you that, and we will maintain to ensure that we try to do all of our other interviews in person. Uh, thanks for, for watching. Thanks for your support and for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the conversation and until next time. Bye for now. So hi, everybody, and welcome to our second interview series from season four. Um, clearly, we've been a little bit delayed because of what's happened with uh, the COVID situation, and we've had to make some adjustments. But uh, here we are today with um, a guest that I'm very, very happy to, to have on the show, someone that I've been wanting to get on the show for some time. He's a bit like the white whale in terms of trying to catch, uh, but uh, we finally managed to get uh, his time, and I'm thrilled to introduce and welcome to the show uh, Mr. Kevin King, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Shiji International. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It's it's great to have you on the show, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. Great. Thanks, Andre. It's been, uh, yes, as you say, it's been a little bit of time to get on the show, but I'm happy I can accommodate now. Indeed. Fantastic. All right, Kevin, let's get started. As I start with everybody on the series, I like to open up by asking everybody a little bit about their background and to tell us about their journey and how they got to where they are today. So obviously, you have have a have a very established career in our industry. You've been around uh, for some time. And you and I met, actually, I think for the first time, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, back in 2003 uh, yep. in Shanghai, which actually happened to be my first trip a business trip to Asia, and uh, that kind of then opened up my eyes, thinking, "Wow, I need to, I need to expand my career here. I need to get out of Australia <laughs> and start looking internationally." Um, but look, let's talk a little bit. Tell, tell us a little about Kevin King's journey from 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 beginning to to where you are now. Okay. Well, I, I started in the industry quite quite young. I I started as a part time job being a bellman, so I <clears throat> I really understand uh, a lot of the industry from from the operational side of the hotel. And that's my career in Australia actually started in, uh, in the Koala Oxford Square, which was an independent hotel owned by the breweries, in uh, Tooth Brewers actually, in, in Sydney. And I started as a bellman and then worked my way up into telephone, answering telephones, front desk, cashiering, night audit. And I think I learned the most about hotel operations in, in night audit, to be honest, in the, the, the overall balancing of hotels and being able to operate the hotels um, in, in every single department. Um, and then later became a management trainee. Um, and from that, we, at that particular hotel, we were one of the first hotels to employ technology. And the technology that we employed was the old HR, HIS system. And at that time, it was System 34, very, very beginnings of the um, mid-range computers operating hotels. There was uh, one hotel in Sydney, the one that I was working at, and then the second hotel in Sydney was, um, was the Wentworth Hotel, which was a Sheraton hotel. And then uh, that prompted me, or actually prompted them to, to reach out uh, and ask me to join Sheraton. So my second uh, job really in the industry was with the Sheraton Hotel. And that's where my life changed. For the, for the better, because my life changed then because I had an opportunity in Sheraton to be transferred to another property. And the property that was available was in Shanghai. So in 1985, I was asked to, if I wanted to go to Shanghai, to work at the Huating Sheraton, which was the first international hotel in Shanghai um, op opening in 1986. 
So then I decided to take the plunge and I went to China in those very, very early years and then worked with Sheraton uh, and stayed with Sheraton all the way up until about 1990 <clears throat> and uh, after nine, and worked in the IT uh, section for them, looked after the pre-opening hotels of the Huating Sheraton in, uh, in Shanghai, then into the pre-opening of the Sheraton in Tianjin and then into Beijing and then spent some time until 1990 in Tianjin. Then I went to work for a company called HIS, which was obviously the company that uh, uh, I was uh, a, a customer for. And then I uh, started the operations in Asia, working from Hong Kong, um, started the operations in Asia uh, for HIS, and, uh, and ultimately I left HIS and had a bit of a break and then went to work with, um, with Mike Ross. Uh, originally in Sydney, I was based in Sydney and started the regional operations center for Micros when Micros first really came into the market uh, and in Asia Pacific and worked with a, um, a, a couple of uh, leadership there, Nirmal Singh and also Stefan Piringa, who I know you know. Um, and we grew that region really, really well with under Micros. And in the year 2000, 1999, 2000, I decided to go back into China. So I went back into China in the year 2000 to take over the, the business in China. Um, we did that. We, we started to transform the business. And lo and behold, in 2003, when I met you, that was around the same time that SARS hit, the, the pandemic at that particular time. Correct. And, yeah. um, you know, that, that started the whole journey in what, what is uh, Micros going to do in China? How do we, how do we adapt? How do we make a bad situation um, stable for the future. And that's when we actually had already known Mr. Lee from Shiji uh, prior to that, as early as year 2000. And uh, we, we started to look at what the opportunities were. And that was when Mr. Lee said to us, why don't I take Micros in China. Why don't I take that? We do a partnership together and we grow the business in China because still at that time, China was still a, a, a beckoning market and a lot of the international chains and whatnot were coming in. So we did that. And, and then the, I suppose in many ways, the, the rest is history because we, we created that partnership with Shiji, a great partnership that lasted, you know, many, many, many years, all the way up until 2014 when Oracle acquired uh, uh, Micros. And uh, then from that, uh, Micros stepped out, obviously, and then Oracle stepped in and the rest is history from there. But uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey. In, in all of my career, I've had five jobs and I stick very closely. They're all very interrelated. Um, and I, I'm very lucky to have backed the right companies to work with and progress my career as I've as I've gone through it. And I'm now in a position that I think is the best I could have ever asked for. Yeah, that's fantastic. You you really took me on a, on a bit of a memory uh, trip myself on, on on two occasions in your in your explanation there. Number one, the Wentworth Hotel. I actually grew up in that hotel. Great. My father my father was the general manager of that property from when it opened up until Sheraton bought it off Qantas. So that, that, uh, that was quite a trip. There's a connection there, which I didn't even know that we had. And also with HIS, I wasn't aware that you'd actually worked with HIS. So you would have known uh, Grant Fries. Yes, very, very well. Yes, well, Grant, Grant was one of the first people actually in technology to give me my technology job in hotel tech. So I came from operations into, at that time, was Trilogy Sydney mm -hmm. and worked as an installer for uh, Libica LTI, which was the first Windows-based operating system that was going to replace HIS. There you are. So, wow, it's, it really is a small world, isn't it, when you think about it? <laughs> and he, he was a lovely guy, Grant. I have to say, I, unfortunately, he passed away uh, a long time ago now, actually in Hong Kong, uh, suddenly. But... Uh, what a, what a, what a, what a man. He was quite a, a force, wasn't he? He was unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, listen, so you've obviously had an extensive career out of all of those times. And, and even though you've had five roles over your career, what would you consider to be some of the, the low points 
and what's been the high points? What, what, what would you single out as kind of thinking to yourself, wow, this is a real challenge? And, and what would you say, geez, I'm so happy that I did this and this has been such a rewarding career for me? Yeah. Say that the, the low point for me in my career was the transitioning from the, the legacy HIS systems. And I, I learned a lot of that. The transitioning from the legacy into the new and that transition that took place. Uh, we all worked on the mini systems for a long time, being IBM, you know, 34, 36, AS400s and whatnot. And then PCs came into the market and became more prevalent into the market and Fidelio was one of the first solutions that, that came in. So that was the hard thing for me at that time in my career was to really change and to accept change and to be able to adopt that change. And it was, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot for myself. It taught me a lot for the teams that I was responsible for, how to guide them within within their um, careers, uh, sometimes even away from what we were doing in order to build them up. Because as, as leaders, we are responsible for the careers of the people that work for us. And when when I have people work for me, I don't look at them just for where they are with me in working the company that I am, but I also have a responsibility to guide them on what their future is going to be, especially when you're working with young people. And you, you can't expect that everybody's going to be with you for the rest of your life or the rest of your career. Right? Um, so I think that the hardest thing for me in my career was really that, that change point from legacy to the next generation. Um, the highest point I, I would have to say was the day that Mr. Lee, the chairman and the CEO of and founder of Shiji um, said to me, we need to change the world. And he believed and believes that we, he and I can change the world of technology. And the, the low point, I thought of that low point when he told me that, of what has to come next. And that was really the highest point that I knew that I was prepared and I was ready to do that next generation and to yeah. take that next step and to take a, a company and grow that company on an international level. And I, I'd had the great past and the, and the leadership from the past, including Mr. Lee, that gave me the foundation to do that. And that's yeah. where we are today, and that's what we're doing today. Yeah, exactly. And then, and here we are, Shiji now with with more than seventy subsidiaries globally and over four thousand employees. Um, that's that's quite a, 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 a huge amount of responsibility for you personally when you consider the, the the scope of that. But aside from you personally, what what is it that you think that um, set Shiji apart uh, from 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 the other major companies that have similar types of, of numbers in terms of representation and employees. Where, where, where's the difference between Shiji and the others, do you think? Yeah. I, well, first of all, let me just uh, give you an update on those numbers. We have now 70 um, of the companies around the world, subsidiaries around the world, more than 5,000 people. Uh, we have a lot of people yeah. obviously um, in, in our businesses in China because we're very large in our retail business in China and our hospitality teams are also growing um, across the China mainland. Um, but the, the, the quintessential thing about Shiji is that we think about the customer first. We, we truly do think about the customer first. And, and what I think customers will, customers will tell you today and what I can see in, in our um, acts of what's happened during this pandemic has um, really solidified that and confirmed that. Um, what, we, what we don't do is to try to just sell something and then walk away. We want to be part of, and one of the, one of the quintessential tasks that Mr. Lee put upon me was don't go out there just to sell something. Go out there and we need to look, we need to listen, we need to learn. And from that, then we create what is the next? What does industry want next? And in order to do that, that's a very, very big undertaking. And 
when you when you look, listen, and learn, you learn a lot, and you have to then prioritize with customer, either existing customer or potential customer, what it is that they are, are seeking in in technology and the next generation of technology um, for for this industry. To do that, it's not something that you can do and then give to others. One of the one of the foundational points of Shiji is that we believe that whatever we develop, whatever we own, we as Shiji must deliver that. So growing the companies internationally and forward loading uh, the companies and the subsidiaries around the world has been a very big role of the internationalization and setting up the internationalization of Shiji. Uh, and in doing so, we we really sort of bring the right people to the mix, the right companies to acquire or technology to build in order to deliver into the market. But when we deliver to market, we deliver that as Shiji. We take that responsibility for the products that we either buy or and and then integrate or the products that we build. Clearly, there's a there's a I would expect a, a fair amount of pressure and perhaps even stress at certain times during the course of your your daily routine. If you can consider the world that we're living in today, what is it that that keeps Kevin King up at night at the moment? Yeah, many many things, <clears throat> many many things, and and you're right, keeping up at night because we don't. Um, and I say we because we're a team. It's not only about Kevin King; it's about the team that is Shaji. And it is a global team. And when it's a global team, um, there are many different timelines and time zones that you work on. Um, so working with my team around the world, physically being kept up uh, you know, every, every night to work with the team around the world. But really the responsibility that, that I and the, and the other senior management within Shiji have on our shoulders to ensure that we can foster and guide our teams in order to continue to build, in order to continue to get ready in this situation of the pandemic, when the world comes back to a little bit of normality and then to normality, to be ready to be there for them. And that is my biggest um, focus point, is, is to really ensure that we are there, that we've got the foundations for what new hospitality is going to be about. And yeah on what is that new hospitality yeah yeah it's uh we're certainly coming into a, a very interesting period not just in history but also in our in our uh chosen careers as well and, and the, the the industry that we work in focusing on on now i'd like to maybe just focus a little bit on some of the biggest challenges that you face leading a company when you consider the co company is so spread out from a global perspective and you have such a a, a diverse amount of cultural so it's culturally so diverse. Um, where would you say, and, and and obviously taking into consideration the whole COVID nineteen situation, but what would be some of your? Could you perhaps list maybe the top three or five biggest challenges that you faced in today's market, leading a company like Shiji? Um, and I'm I'm kind of asking that question so that people that um, you know don't always typically have the exposure to what you have when you consider. Um, the, the the world that you're, you're or the pools that you're swimming in, um, I think it would be quite interesting for the audience to hear what you would consider from your perspective, given Shiji's perspective, what's the biggest challenges that you face today? Yeah, today it's obviously that the the business is not necessarily there. We, we have, uh, actually we're starting to see a resurgence in, in certain regions now in, in business. But uh, when COVID hit in the last uh, number of months, uh, after COVID hit, uh, it it certainly had a dramatic effect on the business. It certainly had a dramatic effect on our revenues um, and our potential revenues coming up, which you know which needed to uh, to come in as far as uh, what our business plan was. We over the last five years have been really looking at what technology needs to be. Uh, we then went out and started to build technology. We we bought a lot of technology. And throughout those years, we had various different conditions of the companies that we, we acquired in 2021, uh, sorry, 2020, sorry, was, um, is, is and was to be our consolidation year, bringing, bringing all the companies and the products and whatnot together into one platform in order to 
provide technology out into the to the industry. Um, and we're made up of a number of different companies, from digital organizations to traditional hard uh, software to hardware business and whatnot. That that we needed to bring together and and really sort of brand as Shiji and be Shiji rather than be the multiples of of companies that they are and the the singularity of cust of the companies that they were. Um, that in 20, uh, 2020 sort of had to take a bit of a sidestep. Uh, while we continue to develop, we had to focus as many of our team members and, and leadership on what does the customer need? What is, because our pain is our pain, but definitely you know that the industry is going through a nightmare. I mean, hotels closing, people being furloughed, people being terminated. Um, you know, just the business is decimated. So we turn that around to say, well, what do we need to do to contribute? Because we keep talking about contributing to the industry, one in technology, but how do we look after them now? What's going on now and deal with today? And, you know, with the, with the leadership of Mr. Lee, we were able to do that. We were able to really look at, you know, stopping what we were doing this year. What, what do we plan to do this year? Um, you know, put a, put, slow that down somewhat so that we could actually talk to our customers, understand from our customers, what do you need? I think Shiji was one of the, one of the uh, earliest companies, the first company to go into the user base and say, hey, you're a customer of ours. We understand this is going to be a, a, a bit of a problem for you. How can we contribute? And we did that. We contributed. We, we gave credits off, uh, off the software. We gave... Um, discounts off maintenance and things such as that, because we knew that this was going to be a, a, a big problem for the industry. So from that standpoint, we we all came together as, as the many different companies that we have. Um, and it's not easy because we have various different personalities and various different regions and cultures that we work with uh, and getting everybody sort of on, on the same page in order to work with a global organization and then together with many different global organizations of the hotel groups and so forth. Um, really, it was a challenging year, but I think that we have been quite successful and I would love you to talk to our customers and, and qualify that. And I'm sure you'll get some pretty good feedback in being able to do that in the contribution. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I guess one of your challenges this year would have been the stay in touch situation that you had to deal with perhaps let's just say unexpectedly and and you recently announced i think it was just last week that you made the the sale of of stay in touch now um I, do i say congratulations on that i mean at, at least you were able to process that uh that 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 uh that issue but how does that make you feel when something like that happens how do you feel about that well we, we invested, actually, before we acquired the business, we invested back in 2014. And, and although it's only 25, 20 to 25% to growing to 25%, um, we had a lot of high hopes for Stay in Touch um, at that time. And then when, obviously, when we acquired 100% of the business, we, we had great hope for, for, the, uh, for the business, for the product and for the team. Um, a great team of people in Stay in Touch, the management team and the, and the employees of Stay in Touch, an amazing group of people, professional through and through. Um, our responsibility when we acquired them was to take a startup company. Um, you know, startup companies make lots of promises um, to, to customers and to, to employees and whatnot. Um, and what we did at the time was to take that company and invest and we invest quite quite a lot of um of, of people and also money into stay in touch uh, to grow it and i have to say that we were um we were successful in in being able to take product to a point of stabilization to a point of growth in our first year and a half of stay in touch we doubled the user base the user base was doubled um, even during covid during the time of the sale, uh, as we were going through the sales process, um, we we had very high take up of, of Stay in Touch, even though we were going through the executive order and had to uh, pass to the next custodian to look after Stay in Touch. Uh, we, we were still able to, through this great team, 
able to sell. Um, it is a very bittersweet moment, I have to say. We, we did not want to sell Stay in Touch. We didn't want to sell it. We were ordered to sell it. And you know, while, while the President of the United States asked that the sale be to, be to be made, we respect that. There's a process in America. When you work internationally, you have to deal with the international rules and regulations of, of the countries that you work in. Um, and therefore, we complied. We respected that and we complied. And we did so, I believe, in the most transparent way. One of the one of the key import one of the key and the most important um, requirement was to find the right custodian to take stay in touch to the next level, mm. and that was always our mantra. Our mantra was not to to scuttle the company. Our mantra was we have to go out there. We have to do all we can do to find the right custodian that can take this business, take this team, look after the customers and continue the development of that. And we've done that. We've successfully done that through uh, through MCR. And you know, there's a there's a gentleman in, in MCR who who is the, the CEO, a guy called Tyler Morse. Um, this man I have a great amount of respect for, a great amount of respect. Typical New Yorker hard businessman, but he, what he says he does, and he's going to invest in Stay in Touch. He uses Stay in Touch in, in, in his properties in, in the US, um, and he's going to take that company. He believes in it. He believes in the people, and he's going to take that forward. If anything, out of this whole experience and this whole learning that we've had is that we have been successful in passing this company towards the next custodian, and then we wish them the very best in taking this company forward. Brilliant. Yeah, that's that's great. It kind of leads to my next question, though. You know, overall, politically, we're seeing, you know, a, a, an increasing level of corporate, let's say, corporate tech saber rattling between China and the US, not just in our industry, but across the tech industry altogether. Um, Stay in touch is obviously an example of where political weight has been applied now. Um, do you fear that any, you know, the future business opportunities and growth could likely be impacted by this? And and also, is there any potential that this that there may be some other request from another brand that you've potentially purchased that uh, you might find yourself in a similar situation with again? So, how, how, what, what's your perspective from that side of things? Yeah, I mean, we are we are a business. First and foremost, we are we are a business. Uh, we're not affiliated anything politically, be that in China or anywhere else in the world. Uh, we're not a Chinese uh, government organization. We have no affiliation to the government in that respect. Um, we, you know, we see this. There, there's always political situations around the world at certain times. You know, through, through political uh, cycles of, of governments and whatnot. There's always something happening that you need to navigate. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's America or whether it's you know Australia or whether it's China or, or whomever. There are always political things going on. One thing I've learned around the world is that pretty much the world is the same all around. Everybody has some political problems. Everybody has you know, the same problems uh, in in many respects. Uh, and for us, we just want to make sure that we have great technology for the hotels, for the industry. Um, we're a business. We don't get involved in any of the politics, political side of um, of the nuances that go on. Um, so from there, we just keep our head down and keep focusing on delivering what we need to deliver. Coming back to the COVID issue now, um, you know, Shiji, being a, an Asian-based company, has probably seen more of these types of crises than than those outside of Asia when you consider SARS and 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 other locally or domestic based issues from from the prior challenges that Shiji may have faced from those other crises how are they applying it as a company now in terms of navigating through this current crisis globally because you know you're representing now brands on a global scale so from your previous learnings how, how what what is it specifically and how are you applying those learnings on a global scale now okay good point if you if you remember my what i said earlier about in 2003 when when we met uh, 2003 was when sars hit and it yeah. hit but he knew where it was going to go 
Um, but what happened in, in those times was that when SARS hit, people listened. And when people listened, it was actually able to be relatively controlled in a short period of time um, globally around the world. And this time when, when COVID hit, um, we, we were an international company already. Uh, the learnings that we took was we need to listen. We need to, we need to operate our business in a sensible way to ensure the safety and security of our teams within Shiji, um, but also to ensure the safety and security of our customers um, as we have to interact with them. Uh, luckily, in, in today's world of technology, and because we're relatively new in our globalization process, all of our technology that we have, we could position, we could empty our offices of people what, with them working at home and being immediately productive because of all the technology that we have and all the cloud-based systems that we operate on an international basis. So uh, all the processes that we had in play. I mean, I'm sitting in our in in our office here in um, in Europe today, um, and there's probably about 15 people here of the 250 people that we normally have operating in in the company. Yet, we are actually more productive in some respects as of what we were when we were all working together. So we've learned a lot from that. We've actually learned a lot of how to coexist, which will change the way we do business going forward and, and how we interact with our teams going forward. I think that's a, a common theme across all industries as well, is that they've real, realized that they can still be productive even remotely and that just because we're not in the office doesn't mean we can't get the job done. Um, I think what people are really missing is that that human connection, that ability to be able to just have that that coffee uh, that coffee chat or that water um, station chat type thing. So, but no, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a common theme we're seeing. I'd like to perhaps just take a step now across to, you know, through our careers, we've no doubt seen that historically hotels have been um, a little hesitant to embrace new technologies and to consider new technology. And perhaps now through this crisis, they're starting to realize the, the benefits of having, the fundamental right technology in place so that they can add to that and be agile and be able to introduce things like, for example, contactless technology to, to support and encourage uh, a contactless environment, especially today. What do you see as some of the most common reasons that hotels hesitate when it comes to introducing new technologies into their ecosystems and their tech stack? What are some of the key reasons that Shiji is being um, presented with around that? It really is the one, one is the fear factor of having to change because a lot of the people are rooted in their existing technologies today with all of their various different connectivities that they've got across the uh, you know, central reservation systems to loyalty systems to external systems and, and all of those interfaces and whatnot, the spaghetti, if you like, uh, that has been created over the years um, and has been really sort of developed over the years because technology in the last 20 years has really sort of grown and has been coupled together. Um, and there hasn't really been a complete technology change that allow hotels or hotel groups to have multiple brands, multiple regions to be able to take on not only the technology, but also being able to be uh, in compliance with all of the various different rules around the world. There's many, many things to consider. And I think one of one of the things that um, there was a similar question asked of me in one of the SCIFT forums when in uh, in the west coast of the US a couple of years ago. When I when I, when I was asked that question, I said people need to give it time. People need to to really understand what it is that they need to do, plan for that, and then don't try to do everything at one time. Stage it stage the delivery of what new technology needs to be. Be sure of what that technology needs to be. Don't just put in technology for the sake of putting in technology. Uh, we have digital solutions like you mentioned, and we through COVID have uh, you know, accelerated what we can contribute into the industry for the digital solutions. Uh, but the 
bigger, wider solutions that are there, the central solutions or the, the property solutions and whatnot, um, groups have to stage that. And that's been, when we say, look, listen and learn, that was one of the learnings that we had. And we started to work with a number of groups on putting the foundational products into play that, that are not too disruptive to the operations of the hotel groups or the hotels in, in the various different regions and being able to stage that changeover. Um, and I think that you'll see within the next uh, year Within the next year, you'll start seeing people coming out of COVID that have already gone through internally in these groups to identify how can we reduce the cost? How can we reduce the cost of ownership of, of the legacy technology? Just as I went through that legacy technology from HIS, mm. I'm to go through that, tech, that uh, legacy technology change again. Okay, now when it comes to, to talent and to hiring people, um, clearly, as you said earlier, you have now over 5,000 employees within Shiji globally. What are some of the key traits that you as a, in particular, what do you look for in people uh, when, when you're hiring and what's, what is important for Shiji's culture? Culture is, is very clear. We want people to be able to work co cohesively together. We want people to be able to understand our mantra, understand what our guide is going to be coming into the future of technology, and then be on the same bus. Now, there are people in many there are people in many structures that um, just want a job, and they just want to come to work and go home. I don't want that. I want people that have the passion. I want people that understand the customer that is willing to fight for that customer and fight for that customer's need. Uh, when I look for people, I look for not only on the technical ability, but also their attitude, that they've got to have the right attitude and they've got to have the right presence to go forward, not just sit around and, and wait for things to come to them. We are in a very unique position I think the industry is in a very, very unique position that we need to have people that can contribute and, and really drive going forward. Attitude is very big. Knowledge is very big. Skill, obviously, is very big. All of the, the key things that you look for in, in people. Mm. When we acquire companies, you know, we've acquired a number of different companies. And you know, when we acquire those companies, most of the people hang around. Most of the people stay. Uh, we find that a lot of the... the um, people that don't stay are, are really not interested in, in seeing what is next. They just got to a point of, of a sale and then decided to move on, right? Um, and that's fine. I mean, when you buy a company, that's, that's often what happens. But mm. many of the people that are within those teams stay on in, inside the business because they have that passion. They were sold that passion when they started something. Mm. We are the custodians of them to take mm. them forward. Mm. And when we do that, then the industry benefits. Yeah, yeah. You know, obviously, you're, you're, as you acquire brands as well, you, you're acquiring companies that within themselves have created their own type of culture and, and, and way of doing things. Um, have you felt that there's, um, has it been a challenge for you to embrace those other different ways of, of methodologies, of cultures within businesses and, and, and bring them into, let's say, the Shiji fold, if you like? Yeah, it's like herding cats. Yeah, I can imagine it must be at times. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've got some really talented people. And, and you, one of the things you've got to, I always say manipulate, but positively manipulate and never negatively manipulate, but positively mm. manipulate people to work with people. And that is the hardest thing I think any manager has is, is, is really getting everybody to work together and singing the same song. Mm. Um, and you know everybody has a different opinion. Cultures, you know, some cultures are loud and some cultures are quiet, and 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 the like. You've got to really be able to get those teams and bring them together. Mm. You have people that that we've got together and they didn't they didn't like it and then they moved out. They left and then they came back because they they found out that outside's worse than what it is inside. They better they better get into the fold, right? And they've been stronger when they come back. Um, and and we welcome that. We you know. That's just part of the journey that we have to go on. But 
I'm losing my hair. It's going gray. Uh, so yeah. way ahead of you there, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> we got really. Good. I'm very happy. Yeah, that's great. Um, final question regarding Shiji. Now, um, do you feel that Shiji has too many brands or not enough? Oh, good question. Branding is very important to us. You know, we we are Shiji. We're very proud to be Shiji. Uh, we have acquired a number of different companies, like we quite we acquired Concept, which is a spa in the Gulf solution, a small company out of Portugal. Put a lot of uh, time, effort, um, a lot of the people that we that we bought into the business, uh, into Concept, and to to regenerate. You know, stabilize the, the product, it's a very old product, old technology, stabilize that, bring it forward, um, and then rebrand it. So we will re we are in the process of rebranding products that we have acquired, companies that we've acquired. And we, we will have, our plan is to have this under a single brand of Shiji, but an element of what it's and where it fits within the platform. For example, our concept solution is, is they say it's golf and spa. It's actually far more than golf and spa. So we're rebranding that to be more in line with what the product really delivers to the market. And same with many of the other companies that we have. You know, Ice Portal is, a, is another one. It's coming in under our Shiji distribution solution because it's a distributed product um, and the like. So we, we take those products, we bring them in under other Shiji leadership or other Shiji branding and incorporate them within that service offering part of the platform. Okay, excellent. Final question, um, and it's a personal one now. You travel a lot yourself extensively. You've seen, I'm sure, many parts of the world and you've stayed in many hotels. What is your favorite hotel and why? Mm, that's a very difficult loaded question <laughs> well hey you know like i said it's a personal question yeah I, I would have to say that um the the best hotel i've ever stayed in i would have to say is the peninsula in new york okay yeah and it was by chance i stayed in that hotel and just the amazing amount of of service that was offered um, and very un unprecedented in, in many ways. I was very, very comfortable there. I stayed there for about a week, and it was like be being part of the family. You, you mm. were really, you know, they knew who you were, they knew everything that you needed, and they delivered. Yes, yeah, so I, I have to agree with you there. Peninsula do a very, very good job. Also, on a technology perspective, they were very much uh, cutting edge for a very long time there in terms of what they were introducing from a technology perspective. Fraser Hiscox did a great job with that group. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, as, as you know, they, they'd even put um, nail dryers in the, in the bathroom for the ladies. So, so that when they were polishing their nails, they could put them under a dryer and they wouldn't have to wait for them to dry. So it's, it's going that extra mile really in many, many different ways. That's right. All those little things mean a lot. Exactly. Okay, good. listen, Kevin, thank you so much. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Um, we, Typically, we, we try to avoid doing these interviews in a virtual sense, but we've been forced in, in the current situation that we're living in to, to do this today. And I'm, I'm hoping that it comes off well. I'm sure it will. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and for being with us today. I know you're a busy man. Um, but uh, as I said before at the start, it's been kind of like you're, you've kind of been like my great white, white whale in terms of trying to catch you and to get you uh, on the show. So I'm thrilled to have you here. And thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. And to the viewer, thank you very much uh, for watching and for tuning in. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, if, please make sure you do. Check us out at techtalk.travel. And uh, we've got a great interview coming up actually with, with um, two GMs uh, talking about uh, current situation as well for, uh, from different cities here in Germany. And that one will actually be in person. So we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, so until next time, thank you. It's bye for now. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.